Well, a very um, hearty welcome to you all. <clears throat> the annual Aquinas Lecture is an opportunity for the Christendom College community to benefit from the scholarship and wisdom of noted thinkers in the tradition of St. Thomas Aquinas. Past Aquinas lectures have been given by Russell Hittinger, Thomas Hibbs, Father Lawrence Dewan, Father Thomas Joseph White, Matthew Levering, Father Stephen Brock, among other distinguished scholars. Today, we are honored to welcome Dr. Anthony Andres. Dr. Andres is currently a tutor at Thomas Aquinas College, his own alma mater. He received his PhD in philosophy from the University of Notre Dame, writing under the world-renowned Ralph McInerney. For 14 years, he served in the Department of Philosophy here at Christendom College, achieving the rank of associate professor and serving as chairman of the department for several years. A point of trivia, I believe that Dr. Andres was the first full-time faculty hire of a new, young president at the time. <laughs> Very young. <Easy. laughs> Still young, ever young. <laughs> Something like that. Dr. Andres has published on a variety of topics, focusing especially on the science of logic in the thought of Aristotle and St. Thomas Aquinas, a topic on which he is deemed a foremost expositor. On a personal note, some 16 years ago, at the goodbye send-off for Dr. Andres, I was honored to say a few words. Here I will share but one comment from those words. I said, if there's one thing I've learned from Dr. Andres, it is this. True education is but the extension of a personal and communal pursuit of wisdom. Today, I say, Dr. Andres, you were a great example then of a man committed to the pursuit of wisdom, and you have only grown in this since your return to your beloved alma mater at TAC, where you practice as a master, the craft of teaching. Thank you for joining us today to speak on St. Thomas Aquinas, angelic teacher. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Andres. Th th thank you for those kind words, uh, Dr. Cutterback, and uh, I'm, I'm very, very honored to be speaking here uh, uh, for uh, doing your uh, St. Thomas Aquinas Day lecture uh, near the feast day of St. Thomas. Uh, uh, very, very proud uh, to uh, have been asked. Uh, I got a chance uh, this afternoon to tour the incredible chapel. It was, it was so magnificent. I, was, I just fell in love with it. Uh, I saw the uh, Sacred Heart window at the, at, the, at the far end of the chapel, and uh, the, eye, the tears started coming out of my eyes. It was, it was incredible. So I, I love Christendom. Christendom's a great place. I'm, I'm so happy to be here. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm just going to jump right in now. Uh, theologians give three reasons why St. Thomas Aquinas is named the Angelic Doctor. First. He lived a life of extraordinary purity, protected supernaturally from the attacks of lust by the ministry of an angel. Second, he taught us a great deal about the angels, their natures, powers, and hierarchy, bringing together the doctrines of Dionysius and St. Gregory the Great. Third, St. Thomas is called the angelic doctor because his mind had an almost angelic power. Pope Leo XIII, in his encyclical letter, Attorney Patris, writes, learned men in former times of the highest repute in theology and philosophy, after mastering with infinite pains the immortal works of St. Thomas, gave themselves up not so much to be instructed in his angelic wisdom as to be nourished upon it. Now today, I want to investigate whether there is 
a fourth reason to call him the angelic doctor. I want to ask whether St. Thomas is angelic as a doctor, that is, as a teacher, whether in some sense his mode of teaching is angelic. To answer that question, we need first to know something about angels. So in my lecture, I'm going to first look at what St. Thomas himself teaches us about the nature of angels, their mode of knowing, and their mode of teaching, if there is such a thing as angelic teaching. I will move on to compare how an angel teaches to how a human teacher teaches so that we can see that St. Thomas's mode of teaching is, in some important sense, angelic. Question 50 of the first part of the Summa Theologiae introduces St. Thomas's doctrine on the angelic nature. Now, in his introduction to this question, he explains that created things are divided into three fundamental kinds. Some creatures are purely spiritual, some are purely bodily, and there are others that are both bodily and spiritual. Now, his concern in this 50th question and in the 14 follow following questions is about whether, is about the first, the purely spiritual creatures. And in the first ar article, he argues that such creatures exist. Now, the chief premise of that argument concerns the way in which God is a creator. St. Thomas notes that what God chiefly intends in creation is to make things that are like himself. But an effect is most perfectly like its cause when the effect possesses those very characteristics by which the cause is a cause. Mm -hmm. For example, the effect of fire is most perfectly like its cause fire when it possesses heat, that by which fire is a cause. <clears throat> But God creates the universe, St. Thomas says, through his intellect and will. So the perfection of the universe requires that there should be at least some creatures that possess intellect and will. Now, the very nature of intellectual knowing, as he argues elsewhere, requires that the intellectual creature be spiritual rather than bodily. And so St. Thomas concludes, Quote, whence in, the order, in order for the universe to be perfect, it's necessar necessary to posit that there be some incorporeal, that is, non-bodily creatures. Now, some of the ancient philosophers, having reached the same conclusion that some creatures are purely spiritual, named them intelligences. Holy Scripture teaches that such creatures exist and that they are God's messengers to man. And for that reason, Holy Scripture calls them angels, which means messenger. In this lecture, I myself will refer to such creatures as angels. But we should keep in mind the name assigned by the philosophers, intelligences, as we proceed, because the word intelligence names an angel according to its nature, rather than according to its role in God's providence for man. Now, Aristotle actually gives a number of intelligences according to what he thought were the numbers of spheres involved in the movements of the heavenly bodies. And the number he gives is, well, it's 47 or 55, depending on which astronomical theory you adopt. But St. Thomas points out that scripture tells us there are an almost uncountable number of angels. In the book of Daniel, we, found, we find, quote, thousands of thousands ministered to him, and 10,000 times 100,000 stood before him. In fact, that's probably a kind of underestimate. <laughs> But the really astounding thing is not 
that there's this countless multitude of individual angels, but that there is in fact a countless multitude of kinds of angels, a countless multitude of species of angels. In, in order to understand this, we need to stop for a moment and think about the difference between corporeal substances and purely incorporeal substances. Every species of bodily, physical, created thing encompasses many individuals. For example, the species man right now embraces about eight, mil eight billion individuals, not counting the many billions who have existed in the past. You and I are two individuals embraced by the species man. And while there are many differences between us, the foundation of all of those differences is the difference in our matter, in our bodily makeup. That is, just to put it quite simply, your soul is in your matter over there, and my soul is in my matter over here. Every other difference between us depends upon this most basic difference. But an angel is a purely spiritual substance not having any material component whatsoever. Therefore, there's nothing that can divide an angel into many different individuals of the same species. In order for one angel to be actually different from another, it has to be a different kind of angel. And if there's an uncountable multitude of individual angels, there has to be an uncountable multitude of species, an uncountable multitude of kinds of angels. Now, St. Thomas pairs that astounding fact with another principle to conclude to something that's perhaps even more astonishing. The other principle is that no two kinds of things are exactly equal. When things are really different in kind, there is always a relation of greater and less. We see this in the physical universe, especially in the realm of living things. The number of plants and animals, the number of kinds of plants and animals is very large. And what we see in the physical universe, if we consider it carefully, is that there's a gradual ascent among them from the least perfect to the most perfect. From the least perfect, like I don't know, an amoeba, a bacteria, to the most perfect, like leaving man aside for a moment, the chimpanzee or the gorilla. Now, the number of species of angels is far, far greater than the number of species of living things. Therefore, we have to conclude that the difference by which the highest angel exceeds the lowest angel is far greater than the difference between the highest and the lowest of the living things, between a chimpanzee and an amoeba. And the least of the angels, if we saw the least of the angels, we would be so dazzled that we, were think we, that we would think we were seeing God. The least of the angels is incomparably eclipsed by the greatest of the angels. So this, is, this may be a good time to summarize St. Thomas's teaching on the nature of the angels. He argues that the perfection of the universe requires that it include creatures that are intelligent and incorporeal, not possessing a physical body. He calls these creatures angels because these creatures do not exist in matter, 
they cannot be individuals belonging to the same species. Each angel is its own species. But the species are not equal. They fall into a gradation from the lowest to the highest, like the gradation found in living things. And scripture tells us there's an almost uncountable multitude of such creatures, so that the highest angel is almost inconceivably more perfect than the lowest. Now this last conclusion leads us to a further consequence. Since angels are essentially intellectual substances, as the philosophers point out, the differences in their natures correspond to differences in their intellectual powers. Higher angels have more powerful intellects than the lower angels. And this is what opens up the possibility of something like teaching and learning among the angels. Now, the way in which such teaching and learning might occur among the angels, however, is very difficult to understand. And I think in order to make that as understandable as possible, we need to compare and contrast the intellect of an angel with the intellect of a human being. Okay. The fundamental fact about the human mind that we need to note here is that it comes into existence without any actual knowledge, only with an ability to know. The intellect of an, of an infant is a blank slate. The infant has to acquire intellectual knowledge about the physical world outside from his senses as the things in the outside world act upon his sense organs. For example, uh, his intellect then abstracts from the senses what's understandable about the things that he senses. For example, the, the infant can only come to understand what colors are because he has seen colored objects with his eyes. The colors of those objects have acted upon his eyes. The, the, the reason is, is that the human intellect is an intellect in, the bod in a bodily substance. Because it's an intellect in a bodily substance, it naturally comes to know bodily things and knows them insofar as those things act upon his sense powers. Angels do not have bodies. They have no sense organs, they have no sense powers. They have no eyes or ears, they cannot see or hear. And so we would ask ourselves, how could an angel know anything at all? St. Thomas teaches that the angelic intellect is infused with knowledge from God at the moment of its creation. So unlike the human intellect, the angelic intellect was never a blank slate. In fact, strictly speaking, the angel comes into existence already knowing everything that he's naturally equipped to know. We can make the contrast clear, I think, by, by applying it to a particular example, knowledge of a dog. Now, a man is not born with the knowledge of the nature of a dog, but he is born with five external sense powers, sight, hearing, etc and internal sense powers like the common sense, memory, the cogitative power. He sees, hears, remembers a multitude of dogs, Fido, Spot, and Rover. His intellect may start out as a blank slate, but by using these sense impressions, receiving from them something intelligible, and leaving aside what's not intelligible, his intellect forms a conception of a dog one concept that is an intellectual knowledge of Fido, Spot, Rover, any other dog you can think of. And that's the way he comes to know what a dog is. An angel, in contrast, has no sense powers. So he cannot learn from his sense powers what a dog is. 
That's okay because he comes into existence already knowing what a dog is. He knows what a dog is, not from what he's received from, sensa from sensation, but from the intelligible species, intelligible species of dog that he was endowed with from the first moment of his existence. But a problem might r arise immediately in your mind. Our intellectual conception of a dog is universal. We know what a dog is by our intellects, but it doesn't give us knowledge of any particular dog. It doesn't tell us, give us a knowledge of Fido, Spot, or Rover. An angel has no sensation, only an intellectual conception of a dog. So we might be tempted to conclude that an angel only knows a dog universally. He knows what a dog is, but he can't know what Fido, he can't know anything about Fido, Spot, and Rover as Fido, Spot, and Rover. And then we would be tempted to conclude that human knowledge is in some respect more perfect than angelic knowledge, that we know some things the angels don't know. That's a mistake. St. <laughs> Thomas answers that angels, in fact, do know individuals. And this is what he says, quote, angels through intelligible, through intelligible forms received from God know things not only with regard to their universal nature, but also according to their singularity. Insofar as the individuals are certain multiplied representations of that unique and simple essence. What St. Thomas said here is not easy to understand, but I'm going to try to give some account of it as, as I understand it. I think what he's saying is, because the angels have already received the intelligible forms directly from God, their intellectual, uh, rep, uh, con their intellectual conceptions are not representations of the individuals as they are for us. Rather, from the angelic point of view, the individual is a representation of the intelligible conception. Thus, the intelligible conception is not just a conception of the universal, but is also a conception of every individual in that universal. They not only know the canine nature, the universal nature of dog, but by knowing the canine nature, they also know Fido, Spot, and Rover. That's something we cannot do. We have to use separate knowing powers, the senses and the intellect, to capture first a knowledge of Fido the individual and then a knowledge of his nature. The angel by one conception and one knowing power captures a knowledge of both the individual and the universal nature. Now, St. Thomas takes this feature of angelic knowledge as a manifestation of a more general principle. What the inferior creature has in a partial and divided way, the superior being has as something whole and simple. And this, this principle, by the way, has implications beyond angelic knowledge. So it's, it's worth our time to consider some examples that illustrate this principle outside of the realm of angels. Uh, here is the example I thought of immediately. When I was a boy, I didn't like another boy named Gino. <laughs> Gino was a good baseball player. I was a terrible baseball player. I don't know if you know about Little League Baseball, but like, the guy in right field is the worst player, and the guy in left field is the second worst player. I was in left field. The guy in right field was blind in one eye, so he couldn't really see anything. That's how I got the promotion to left field. But, but you know, I used to console myself because I was a good basketball player, and Gino wasn't very good. By the way, the moral philosophers call that envy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
But there was this problem. There was this kid named John. He was not only a better baseball player than I and a better basketball player than Gino, he was a better ba baseball player and basketball player than both of us. All right? I would, I, I would express it this way. I was a basketball player. Gino was a baseball player. Robert was an athlete, pure and simple. Robert's athleticism contained as something whole and simple what Gino and I had in a partial and divided way. <clears throat> Here, uh, here's a second example. Uh, you know, some actors in movies, they're great in comedies, they're funny in comedies, but when they try to do a drama, they're just unconvincing. Others, they're great in drama, but they're stiff and awkward when they try to do a comedy. And then, but, but if you take the best actors, it turns out they're good at both. They're very funny in, com in comedies, and they're very convincing in dramas. They are not comic actors or tragic actors. They're just actors, pure and simple. And finally, to take an uh, even more serious uh, concept uh, uh, example here, we can talk about political regimes, especially uh, monarchy, which illustrates this most clearly. The various ministers of the king have various political powers. Some help draft laws, others enforce them, others still judge particular violations of the law. But the king possesses all of these powers as one royal power. The king can make laws, he can direct their enforcement, he can judge particular violations. The ministers of the king possess political power partially and in, as divided into three powers. But the king possesses the whole of political power simply, not as three. Now this principle which we saw is manifested in the comparison between angelic knowledge and human knowledge <clears throat> is also manifested in the comparison between the knowledge of a lower angel and that of a higher angel. The lower angel exceeds our mode of knowing because by his one concept of dog, he knows dog not only universally, but he knows that individually, Fido, Spot, and Rover. <clears throat> but the lower angel might have several different concepts by which he knows dog, cat, horse, and every other animal. The higher angel exceeds the lower angel by knowing dog, cat, horse, and every other animal, not by a multitude of conceptions, but by one simple conception that embraces them all. Now, if, if, if you remember uh, your, your, your logic course, you might say to yourself, well, wait a minute. Don't I have a, a conception of animal? And is an animal the genus for dog, cat, and horse? How is a higher angel different from me? This is the answer. By our conception, our generic conception of animal, we know dogs, cats, and horses only insofar as they have some common sensitive nature. Just as our, our knowledge of the species dog is not a, a knowledge of Fido, Spot, and Rover, so our generic conception of animal is not a perfect knowledge of any species of animal as species. That is, thus, our generic conception of animal is less perfect than our specific knowledge of dog, cat, and horse. In contrast, the higher angel knows with one conception everything that the lower angel knows with many conceptions. His conception of animal is not generic. It is a perfect conception of the species dog, cat, and horse as well. So when the higher angel knows animal nature as a whole and simply, 
he knows these natures more perfectly than does the lower angel. In sum, the higher angels not only have a more perfect nature than the lower angels, they also have a more perfect knowledge. The higher angels know more than the lesser angels. They know in a more perfect way, and they use fewer concepts to do that. A tough-looking panda bear walked into a restaurant and demanded dinner. <laughs> when the waiter handed him the check, the panda pulled out a gun, fired into the ceiling, and began to walk out. The waiter called out, hey, what'd you do that for? The panda threw him a dictionary and said, look it up. So the waiter opened the dictionary, turned to the definition of panda, and, and, and read, a large black and white mammal of western China which eats, shoots, and leaves. <laughs> I, 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 so when, when, I, when I taught here, and, and I, I actually still do this where I, where I teach now, uh, sometimes in the middle of class I'll break out into a joke to, uh, but it has nothing to do with class. To, uh, <laughs> To interrupt the monopoly, and, and in fact, I still have one of my one of my possessions is a a joke book for Dr. Andres that had been assembled by students to help me come up with some new new jokes. So I was starting to repeat them. I still use them. Uh, okay, so uh, once again, the angels not only have a higher uh, nature than the lower, they have a more perfect knowledge. This conclusion then invites us to ask whether the higher angels teach the lower angels. Now, St. Thomas does not use the word teaching when speaking of the relation of one angel to another. But he does acknowledge that the higher angel can share his knowledge with the lower. And he calls such sharing not teaching, but illumination or enlightenment. So our next task is to look at the way in which one angel enlightens another angel. Now, St. Thomas points out that if any being is going to have knowledge, it must have two things, a power of intellect and a, conception of the, a concept of the thing understood, which is a likeness of the thing understood. For example, in order for an angel to understand what a dog is, his, he must have an intellect with the ability to understand canine nature, and he must possess a concept, which is a kind of likeness of the canine nature. So when a higher angel enlightens the lower, that is, brings about new knowledge in the lower angel, he can do this either by having an effect on the intellectual power of the lower angel, or by bringing about in the lower angel a likeness of the thing understood. According to St. Thomas, the higher angel does both. He, he somehow affects strengthens the intellectual power of the lower angel. And he also brings about a likeness in the lower angel of the thing to be understood. Uh, the way St. Thomas puts it is that the, the higher angel puts his intellectual power into some sort of spiritual contact with the lower angel. And he talks about this as making his intellectual power continuous with the intellect of the lower angel. And by doing this, he strengthens the intellect of the lower angel so it can grasp what beforehand exceeded its power to know. Uh, I, I'm, I, I was trying to think, what are likenesses of this that are part of our experience? I, I, I could think of a couple. One was the... Uh, what we call moral support. Uh, I am more able to resist temptation and to undertake the right course of action merely because virtuous friends are present. Without the presence of virtuous friends, I fall into sin much more easily. There's another analogy you could take from the world of physics. 
the magnetic field of a weak magnet is strengthened merely by the sympathetic presence of a nearby stronger magnet. And I think he's, St. Thomas is thinking something like this is what happens with angels. By, merely by a kind of spiritual proximity or continuity, the higher angel strengthens the intellectual power of the lower angel, lends him greater intellectual power, makes him able to understand what he could not understand before. That's with respect to the intellectual power. With respect to the concept of the thing understood, this is how St. Thomas thinks it works. The higher angel presents to the lower angel the concept by which he knows, but he presents it in a way that's proportioned to the lower angel. We've already seen that what the higher angel knows as a whole and simply, the lower angel has to know in a partial and divided way. Therefore, the conception by which the higher angel knows the truth is more universal than that by which the lower angel is able to know it. The lower angel can't handle the concept that the higher angel has. So to propose the truth to the lower angel, the higher angel must proportion his simpler, more universal conception by presenting it in a multiplied and divided way. Something like this is at work when we see a mother feed her toddler. The mother does not simply slap a steak in front of the toddler. The toddler cannot eat the steak. She cuts the steak into small pieces that the child can take in. So likewise, the higher angel has to cut up his knowledge so that the lower angel can take it in. In sum, the higher angel enlightens a lower angel in two ways. First, it strengthens the lower angel's faculty of knowing by uniting his intellectual power to that of the lower angel. Second, he proportions his conceptions to the power of intellect being strengthened and proposes the truth in a way, in a, in, in a way that can be known in a divided and partial way. So if we can say one angel teaches another, this would be its, his mode of teaching. Now that we've seen how angels enlighten one another, we're almost ready to see whether we can make any sense of saying St. Thomas teaches angelically. I say almost ready because we just need to look briefly at how men ordinarily teach other ordinary men. Uh, St. Thomas talks about it in his disputed, in a part of the disputed question on truth called On the Teacher. Now the background for this is that St. Augustine has a dialogue in which he argues that God alone is the principal teacher of man. St. Thomas agrees with this. God alone creates the intellectual light in the human soul and implants in the intellect the first principles in, in virtue of which all men have knowledge. But still, St. Thomas is at pains to point out that there is a true sense in which one man teaches another. He compares that activity to the activity of a medical doctor. Now, the medical doctor is not the principal cause of healing. The principal cause of healing is an active power naturally present in the patient. If that principle is strong enough, the body heals itself. The patient doesn't need a doctor. He just gets better. If that principle is not strong enough, the sufferer calls in the medical doctor to assist that natural principle to perform its work. Consequently, in the process of healing, the medical doctor must follow the order of nature. His job is to supply what the natural principle would if it could. Like every art, medicine imitates nature. Human teaching has to follow the same pattern. The principal cause of learning is always the active power of knowing present in the student. And if that active power is strong enough, the student learns by himself without the aid of the teacher. But when that active power is not strong enough to learn something, the teacher aids that natural activity 
by imitating it. So in, a, in particular, a teacher uses words to propose to the mind of the student the conceptions that are necessary to understand the truth. And the teacher proposes them to the student in the order in which the student would use them if he were able to discover the truth by himself. Uh, for example, a bright student understanding the first principles of geometry might discover for himself the construction of an equilateral triangle. But in order to do so, he would have to form the proper conceptions in his mind and put them in the proper order. When the student does not discover that proof but learns it from the geometry teacher, uh, let's say Euclid, for example, Euclid has to suggest those very same conceptions by the words which signify them, and he has to suggest them in the same proper order. Just as the medical doctor aids and imitates the natural process of healing, the teacher aids the process of, of learning and imitates the process of discovery. This is the normal mode of human teaching. Now, both the human teacher and the angel, enlightening angel bring about new knowledge in another from the knowledge that they already possess. And neither brings into existence the intellect of the learner nor the first seeds of that knowledge. But the human teacher and the angel differ in that the human teacher is in innating the mind of the student, brings about knowledge which, in principle at least, the student was capable of discovering on his own. The higher angel only enlightens the lower angel about matters that the lower could never discover for himself. Second, the human teacher cannot increase the power of his student's intellects. The teacher cannot make his students smarter. <laughs> But the higher angel can increase the power of the lower angel's intellect. He can make the lower angel a little smarter. Finally, the human teacher teaches in virtue of conceptions which are more, no more universal than the conceptions of the students. And this is because both the teacher and the student receive their intellect, intelligible species from things through the senses. But as we saw before, Angels receive their conceptions directly from God, the higher angel receiving more universal conceptions proportioned to the higher power of his mind. And it is in virtue of these more universal conceptions that the lower angel can teach. So, to repeat these three differences, the human teacher teaches what the student in principle could discover for himself, the higher angel does not. The human teacher does not increase the power of his student's intellect, the higher angel does. The human teacher teaches in virtue of having conceptions of the same degree of universality as his students, while the angel enlightens by virtue of having more universal conceptions. At first glance, it would seem that St. Thomas could never teach according to these angelic modes. He's a man, not an angel. But I think we can investigate this question profitably if we approach it in this way. Although St. Thomas cannot, strictly speaking, enlighten his students, could it be the case that his way of teaching is more like that of an angel than the teaching of other human teachers? And I think we can say yes. First, we should note that while St. Thomas certainly wrote about philosophy and even the liberal art of logic, his chief duty was to study sacred doctrine. And as he makes clear in the very first question of the Summa Theologiae, the principles of sacred doctrine, the articles of faith, exceed the human capacity to know and must be received by a divine revelation and held by faith. And so, uh, kind of as in the enlightenment of one angel by another, 
St. Ma Thomas manifests truths to his students that they are in principle incapable of discovering for themselves. Now, of course, St. Thomas shares this, St. Thomas's teaching shares this attribute, first of all, with the authors of scripture, also with the fathers of the church, and then with many other teachers of sacred doctrine, past, present, and future. But the unique role of St. Thomas is captured, I think, by one of his most famous disciples, Cardinal Cajetan. He wrote this about St. Thomas. Because he highly venerated the sacred teachers, therefore he, in a certain way, obtained the intellect of them all. That is, while the various fathers and doctors to greater and, and less degrees enlightened the church about various parts of sacred doctrine, St. Thomas's mind was so powerful that he could encompass their minds and enlighten the church about the whole of sacred doctrine. And the monument to that amazing accomplishment is St. Thomas's Summa Theologiae. Now we might not notice the audacity of that project which when he announces it in the, in the prologue to that work. There in the prologue to the Summa he writes, with confidence in divine help, we will attempt to take up briefly and clearly those things which pertain to sacred doctrine. But note, he doesn't say some of the things that pertain to sacred doctrine, but simply those things, that is all of those things that pertain to sacred doctrine. He, he aims to teach about the whole of divine revelation. And what's fascinating to me is that as you read the Summa, you come to realize that the whole work seems to be present from the very beginning in his mind, not just an outline, but in detail. He frequently makes reference not only to the details of what he's already written, but to the details of what he hasn't written yet. And the Summa is an enormous work, thousands of pages, covering almost the whole of sacred doctrine. It doesn't cover the whole because he died before he finished it. It's, and it's intricately ordered, and it shows all the signs of being carefully written. Carefully written, and yet history tells us that it was written in an incredibly short time. The Summa Theologiae manifests the universal breadth of St. Thomas's intellect. But here's another aspect of the, of the Summa. It's written for beginners. And beginners who've studied the liberal arts, who've studied philosophy, <laughs> etc. So not total beginners, but still beginners. And it really is proportioned to them. And now, I'm not, I'm not saying a beginner understands everything perfectly. And each article is better understood in the context of its question. The question is understood in con better understood in the context of a larger whole. And yet, each particular article in the Summa can be read and is intelligible as a unit by itself. You can get something about an article just reading an article of the Summa. Each article makes sense by itself. In fact, my experience as a teacher is that the Summa is sometimes deceptively clear. Students have trouble seeing sometimes that there's more to say on the subject than what St. Thomas says in a brief article. St. Thomas's ability to write the Summa points to an incredibly unified grasp of the whole of sacred doctrine, and yet it also points to an ability to proportion that whole of sacred doctrine to minds which must receive its truths in a divided and multiplied way. And as we saw before, the reception of what is whole and simple in a multiplied and divided way is the mode in which the higher angel enlightens the lower. And as far as I know, St. Thomas is the only teacher of sacred doctrine who has successfully accomplished this angelic feat. I'd like to end by recalling our key points. Angels are real. They are incorporeal, intellect, intellectual creatures, each its own kind of being, 
none equal to another. Each comes into existence with a knowledge far vaster than any man acquires over a lifetime. A higher angel knows more perfectly than a lower one, knowing as a whole and simply what a lower angel knows only partially and in a divided way. But the higher angel can enlighten the lower one by proposing truths to the lower which he could never discover by himself. He does this by proportioning his conceptions to the power of the lower and by strengthening the intellect of the lower angel. And in this we see a likeness to the teaching of St. Thomas. We saw that St. Thomas was for us a teacher of truths we could never discover on our own, that he had knowledge of them as a whole and in a unified way, but that he proportions them to us who can only take them in in a partial and divided way. And so in those two ways, St. Thomas's teaching has an angelic character. But St. Thomas also taught us that the higher angel strengthens the intellectual power of the lower angel. Does St. Thomas himself do anything similar? Can he strengthen the intellectual power of his readers, of his students? Now, in one way, he doesn't, because strictly speaking, that's impossible for any man. But I was thinking about this, trying to come up with something. <laughs> and then I, I remembered a passage from Aristotle's book on the soul. In book three, chapter four, Aristotle explains some of the differences between the senses and the intellect. And he writes, here's one of the differences, quote, after a strong stimulation of a sense power, we are less able to exercise it than before. He's thinking about, I look at a bright light and I go into a dark room, it's hard to see things, I have to wait to adjust. But in the case of mind, thought about an object that is highly intelligible renders it more and not less able afterwards to think about objects that are intelligible. Now, sacred doctrine is about the most highly intelligible objects, principally about God. And so maybe we can say this, the teacher of sacred doctrine has the ability to make the minds of his students more able to think clearly about less exalted things. And I think St. Thomas does accomplish this. As a teacher of sacred doctrine, he had the responsibility to study, make judgments upon, and pass on to his students the philosophical doctrines that prepare them to understand sacred doctrine. And so St. Thomas wrote detailed commentaries of many of the works of Aristotle. What we notice is that in those commentaries, St. Thomas always remains a teacher of sacred doctrine. When matters come up in philosophy that pertain directly to sacred doctrine, he does not hesitate to use the light of sacred doctrine to illuminate the lesser sciences. He uses sacred doctrine to make the things studied in the lesser sciences more intelligible to the student. So, perhaps in some sense, St. Thomas's teaching can even be thought of as strengthening the minds of his students in the way the higher angel strengthens the intellectual power of the lesser. Thank you.